I cannot hear you at all. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and we are okay. ready to start. We are already live now. So, hi everyone. My name is Zoltan Tundik. Uh, I am the co-founder of Hifter Agency. Uh, we are we started this uh, series of webinars uh, this month uh, to share some more quality learning opportunities for everyone. So today we are going to talk about decentralized communities and social innovations with the help of blockchain. Blockchain, which is now at its it's really at, at its epicenter now with all this crisis and uh, uh, technology push forward. So. What better way to kickstart such a such a discussion than have uh, Dr. Mihaela Ulieru, who I would like to ask to say hi to our <laughs> viewers. Uh, hello, hello, hi from Washington DC here in the United States. Good hi. to be with you, and thank you for this invite. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation, uh, Miss uh, Dr. Ulieru is a blockchain champion at the World Economic Forum, where as a member of the Global Agenda Council on Data-Driven Development, she advocated to the list the blockchain among the 2016 top emerging technology developed in collaboration with Scientific American. Uh, Dr. Uriezu's research is distributed, in, is, uh, in distributed intelligence systems, created a, a strong foundation for uh, governments on blockchain, uh, as an institutional technology and for its role in the revolution, revolutionizing manufacturing, logistics, and uh, even home uh, land security. Uh, Dr. Uh, M, as she is being <laughs> sometimes quoted, has been awarded two academic research chairs, uh, the Industrial Research Chair in Mobile Technologies and the Canada Research Chair in Adaptive Information Infrastructure for the E-Society. Uh, and she authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications. Wow, that is really, really huge uh, accomplishment. Uh, her thought, thought throughout leadership uh, led to numerous board appointments, including the Science Council of Singapore, Canada, and European Kim Commission, and on e EEE, NSR, NSF, and other prestigious advisory committees. You can look her bio up on our website if I'm something, if I'm not reading something correctly. Uh, she is a global leader with an Aspen, with the Aspen Institute, uh, and also the president of Impact Institute for the Digital Economy, advising several blockchain startups, nonprofits, and governments around the world. Uh, like I told you, her bio, her bio is really extensive. You can look her up on our website and also you can reach her on LinkedIn where, where she's very active. So, Michaela, please correct me if I missed anything from <laughs> your extensive bio. Uh, and and I, I would like to start with a quick question. And uh, as we usually do in our webinars, do not stick to just a small portion. You can go deeper into the subjects because we have time we have the audience who likes uh, hearing more so there have been many talks all around the world about decentralization uh, with the help of blockchain but for me and certainly for some of our audience today uh, decentralized communities is something new on the on the horizon so could you tell us more about this idea no absolutely and uh, you know it's it's actually not new at all. Sorry to disappoint you guys. Maybe with blockchain, of course, because yeah. now technology is enabling us. But decentralized communities, that's how human society has organized since primitive times. Uh, so they started to trade and to, to organize themselves in community. Uh, and it's called the primitive community, if you remember. And as society evolved, then the so-called city-states appeared which are called polis, the first one in Sumer and Mesopotamia. And then they became bigger. In, in Greek, they were called polis. And then the megalopolis appeared with the bigger states. And then they became empires. The problem with those kind of uh, big behemoths centralized is that those at the fringes were always uh, those who were disadvantaged and disempowered. So the strong became stronger, the, the weak became weaker. And so, you know, all this uh, inequality and inequity uh, spread around the world from this centralized uh, large 
uh, structures. With the advent of technology and, of course, blockchain now, uh, we see that we can self-organize, and that's what I studied. So in two words, I think my career can be summed up as decentralization warrior. So as the Canada Research Chair in East Society, I studied how actually we can uh, turn around the pyramid, if you want to call it like that, the inequality pyramid, and empower those at, at the fringes to self-organize in communities. However, history, you know, pervades with the examples of such decentralized communities. And we are even using now I mean, uh, forms of decentralized communities around mainly. So the, there are two aspects of this. First of all, they emerge today from the current social, social organizations when a crisis occurs, and especially an economic crisis. Because there, it is then that there's not enough money created by these centralized institutions for those at the fringes. And then, for example, if you have a nonprofit and you give some credit to those at the fringes, then you can create a microeconomy for them to trade with each other, even if they are, uh, they do not have enough, let's say, dollars or euros. So let me come back and, and give you this example, which I mentioned, uh, like uh, in Austria. In 1932, so you being there in Europe and very close to Austria, I don't know if you are aware, guys, but uh, the city of Virgil gave vouchers to unemployed people during the Depression who, uh, because the city did not have enough uh, money to uh, employ people, for example, to repair roads or do some other kind of work. So people were paid with those vouchers, which they then can you could use to buy bread and so on and so forth. So local economy. Um, another example, which is probably more easy for us today to understand, is um, the Vir, the the Wirtschaftsring in uh, um, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So the Wirtschaftsring. Yeah. yeah. So so that's clear. And so like with air miles today, yes, we can we can get air miles very similar to how the future was working in 1930. So I can either buy with dollars uh, or with air miles a flight if I have air miles. Then I can use them in hotels or to buy goods and so on and so forth. So I can redeem. So these are also ways in which people can depart from the classic economy and inject some. Uh, some more economic power into a community. But when it comes to the, those, uh, let's say, at the fringes and who do not agree with the centralized decision-making, also movement can be stirred in this way. For example, the city of Schonau in Germany in the early 90s, they have uh, created a movement against nuclear energy. And it was like parents against nuclear energy and they decided in their community to put solar panels on their homes and trade with each other solar energy, and they got credit. They okay. credit themselves. They created their created their microeconomy, and they abolished the nuclear power central behemoth from their uh, community. So you know, uh, decentralized communities are all about empowering those at the fringes to really do what they believe is in their own interest, versus what the centralized uh, powers believe is in their interest, which is the big banks and, and uh, politicians uh, yeah. in the capital cities. Um, I think that's kind of uh, uh, an idea in general without blockchain. But if we come now, blockchain, what blockchain is doing is only enabling these decentralized communities. Why? Because uh, now these vouchers can be uh, in the form of a digital currency, and they can go around in those places where in the community as digital currencies, and then you know it can be local or global. <laughs> I can have a, a a movement around the world for a cause which is fueled and incentivized incentivized by digital vouchers or cryptocurrencies, if you want. Um, and one example. For, you know, and, and because you mentioned the social innovation, just one example of how blockchain can really um, change things uh, with social innovators, also along the lines of what I was telling you about what was happening in Shona in the 90s without blockchain. 
So uh, in Guatemala, a social innovator, Veronica Garcia, has started a company, BitLumens, in which with blockchain, now people can actually use their own good behavior as credit because uh, she uses sensors to track people's behavior. If they, for example, are using kerosene lamps or if they are using uh, solar uh, or, or if they are using other means to pollute. So um, in uh, those, uh, uh, let's say, very disadvantaged communities in, in Guatemala, uh, Veronica is changing uh, the world because she is giving to those people uh, the possibility to use data as currency. So if I collect the good behavior uh, in form of currency and give people credit because they do not pollute. With that credit, they can pay for the solar panels, which I am installing on their homes. They can pay for the electricity from those solar panels. And they can ultimately create a microeconomy because with the credit, they can also buy a pump and water various uh, uh, let's say, plants in their garden, and then they sell those plants, and so on and so forth. So these microeconomies can be enabled. In oh, okay. Way. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so I can see someone on my screen. Is there a part of... Uh, yes, uh, yes, it's our uh, guest hi. who, who we, he will, he will uh, connect <laughs> later. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Uh, hi. I just I wanted want... to say hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I also wanted to ask you that uh, what are the steps to be taken in order to be such a community or are there some that are, might already exist in testing that we don't know of? Absolutely. And so there are many of them exist, you know, and of course, I did not uh, mention a lot of them. But um, the main. OK, so starting with the steps, the main steps are, first of all, you have to create and distribute this vouchers this form of currencies and enable uh, the communities to have access to them for example via mobile phones so simple uh, just uh, like a text message to if i want to pay you uh, for for a service to send you a text message and the money is there so this enablement uh, so create distribute and enable the payments in the currency and then to have a sort of uh, exchange means uh, with the national currency. So you can use both, of course, and people can also depart from their own microeconomy if they want to tap into the larger economy. And uh, of course, you need to have the social innovators, the entrepreneurs uh, among there. And so as examples, the poster child for, for blockchain-enabled uh, communities, these decentralized communities, is Bancor, the Bancor network. I don't know if you heard of that, but it was started no. by Galia Bernardi. It is a protocol. So ba the Bancor protocol, what it does is actually converts and enables the conversion of these uh, digital currencies, digital vouchers from one to another. So for example, with tribes, yes, here in North America, we still have tribes in South America, in, in Africa and in other places, of course. So, so they, can each of them can have their own currencies depending on their so some of them are more related to fishing others to hunting and then they come together and they exchange those goods for which they specialize but then they can convert those currencies from one to another very easy but let, so in order to explain this i will give you an example of uh, what uh, Bancor is doing in kenya so before blockchain uh, there is a, a social entrepreneur called Will Rudnick. Will Rudnick was a, a is a scientist actually, uh, like a high, high, highly specialized physics uh, PhD from Denver, Colorado, and he went on a mission which was a, like a, a charity mission to Kenya to teach mathematics and physics to kids. But then he realized that those kids who he was teaching, they would never get a job. He, he realized that actually 40% of the population was unemployed and they did not stand the chance. Hmm. And then he also looked at, um, okay, so what is money? Money is a medium of exchange on which someone agrees that, you know, if I give you, let's say, a bar of gold, <laughs> you give me 
let's say a cow for it, I'm fine, you know. So it 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 can, and then you can use that bar of gold to to exchange it for for euros and do something else. So so money is a medium of exchange, and they don't. We can empower communities to have their own money, just like how states are using money today. So why not? So Rudnick was thinking about that, and then he returned seven years or eight years later to Kenya. And he created in Mombasa the so-called Eco Pesa, which is colored paper. So he literally <laughs> gave people colored paper, red, blue, <laughs> symbolizing various things, you know, various items. And people were starting to, to pay with that colored paper. And he used the nonprofit, which was giving people credit. So the main problem with unemployment, with, with the poor, is that they do not get credit from the banking behemoth. But if you can enable a nonprofit to actually give credit to people and let's say spread those vouchers and enable the, them if they earn the vouchers by, if they do work, let's say house, housework or anything else, then to exchange the vouchers via the nonprofit into the let's say Kenyan feeling or the Euro, then you empower those communities to create the uh, local microeconomies. So from this uh, colored, uh, uh, eco pesa, colored paper money, um, then, you know, uh, Rudnik met with Galia Bernarsi from Belcor and they created the digital versions of this, uh, of such currencies. And that is uh, known, if you want to Google it, as Sarafu Network, because Sarafu means cash in Kenyan. Okay. So the Sarafu <laughs> Network has many other kinds because many communities there are using it. For example, some are using it in schools to pay for meals and uh, and for uh, school fees or for books and so on and so forth. So various kinds of uh, well, such okay. local currencies. And what Bancor enables is algorithmically to convert one into another, but as well into the local Kenyan shilling. So that's how you can actually start economies. That's very interesting. And yes. Just a quick question popped into my mind now. What about Bitcoin? Uh, do you think that... Yeah. This can now somehow enable more such decentralized communities. Uh, well, Bitcoin, in terms Bitcoin, of popula popularity, yeah. because everybody heard about Bitcoin and uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. But Bitcoin is just one of them. Yes. Yeah? So yeah, I, yeah, can, I, when I mentioned I give you the bar of gold. I can say I give you Bitcoin. You know, it's it's kind of yeah. <laughs> it's the same. It's part of those. Currency. So Bitcoin can be considered as the bar of gold. You know, and people oh. are saying Bitcoin is the gold of cryptocurrencies. Yes. yes. So <laughs> everybody can have instead of the US dollar in the crypto world, they can consider, okay, we have Bitcoin. And yeah. then we all exchange uh, against that. But of course, Bitcoin is itself not very stable. So there are other ways to do money now, digital. And I'm yeah. working on one of them now that you asked about Bitcoin. So I do not know if you heard about the sovereign, which is the, the, the fiat currency of the Marshall Islands, which is again coming uh, back to this. It's a community. It's a small community of islands in the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. But they use the U.S. dollar and uh, for many reasons. Yes, because the U.S. has done yeah. nuclear tests there and so on and so forth. So now they are reclaiming their community independence. Mm -hmm by uh, creating their national currency in a totally digital form as fiat. Mm -hmm. And it is designed a bit better as a money than Bitcoin is because it, uh, there are some other things programmed into the blockchain of the sovereign, like identity and, uh, you know, this uh, KYC, AML, and also keeping the privacy, but as well, um, they take care of the inflation. So to keep the stability of the currency, they are using Milton Friedman's X percent rule. So every year, a 4% is released, an extra money is released to the population, but also distributed. First of all, distributed in form of a universal basic income to everyone, which empowers everyone equally, again, taking care of equality, but also into funds which are critical to them, like fishing, uh, cleaning the waters, uh, climate fund, health fund, and so on. And this is done programmed by, you know, program programming this into the blockchain. That's what the blockchain enables with the smart contract to program also how the money, where, and also to track where the money goes. So you cannot have corruption in a system like that. Yeah. So yeah, so it's uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot is going on in the world.
And, and the current crisis has somehow created a deglobalization, but also gave the chance for some online innovation that can help communities stay in touch among each other. And I wish it was a better world, but all we are seeing now is arguing self-isolation based on idea uh, of by many. And, and I'm talking about both sides here. If you if you know what I mean, this can only lead to be to the creation of in some countries to mini North Koreas, where some only accept one side of the story and totally eliminate all the other information. That in an ideal world, it would be vital in order not to become a totalitarian system. Uh, what is your, your opinion about this, and how would uh, the centralized communities work in such a world? Then, and there are many aspects to what you say. It's like it triggers so much in a decentralization warrior like me, you know, an egalitarian fighter. What you are doing here with your news, let's say, yes, and, and with, with your program is actually a part of restoring uh, uh, things. Because so one aspect of all this is what we call science versus conspiracy and what fake news and all these centralized platforms are enabling that they are created and we have done studies with my society you know research that actually facebook twitter are stirring and they are thriving on conspiracy more than on real facts and real news and they are uh, practically creating a lot of discord in the world. And and, uh, uh, it, and it is maybe not the intent initially, yeah. but uh, because of how they are driven by the big corporations, by advertising, by this and that. And of course, advertising is just lying in, in the service of someone who wants to sell you something. And, exactly. and so, on. <laughs> so, so as long as this platform, centralized platforms are ruling, the, the, the news world and, and we have all this lying and fake news, we will not have uh, uh, justice in the world and as well as we will have people misled quite a lot. So um, another aspect of this is this is going on, of course, not only uh, where you are, but also here in the US. So we have, I mean, in Washington DC, I don't know how much you follow the news here. We have riots and we have a lot of unrest and social unrest now. And in Portland, you know, like um, this, uh, it's becoming so in Portland. Portland is one of the most, um, let's say, rebellious uh, population in the US and the most forward looking and uh, revolutionary, I would say. They still continue since two months, they continue their the protest, like really, really intense protest. And they're, they are determined to stay there uh, to ask for their rights. And now the, the government here have, has intervened into the Portland state, which is unprecedented because in a democracy like in the US, yes, the, the state uh, government has precedent, takes precedence and they decide if what they do is a protest, if they stop it and how and so on and so forth. But now the National Guards and the uh, uh, special forces have been deployed in Portland. And what they have done, they appear with cars which are unmarked. I mean, you do not know if it's the police or who it is. Then they are all masked. You do not know if you are being kidnapped and by who you are brought in a car. And they don't know, you may disappear and nobody knows where you went because these cars, you know, are like, they even don't have uh, plates. And this is happening in the United it's States the of America. Well. <laughs> the epitome of freedom. So, you know, if you can beat that with what is happening at your end, <laughs> We know, but we are totally stunned by by what is going on uh, yeah. here in our backyard. So, so yeah, I, 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 and and now to answer your question, maybe a bit more, but you are answering it by what you are doing by bringing awareness to people, and of course. Um, when you say like, it, this is not a matter of, of blockchain. It is a matter of people being aware and then enabling them to self-organize in a way or another. And I gave you examples of how can they self-organize, but there are many other social innovators. For example, and I, if you want, I can give you some more example of how people can self-organize, but around, you know, around various causes and movements. So one movement can be that of the protesters, let's say. And we have seen those also in other countries. But um, another one is, for example, um, if a hurricane strikes, 
again, there's a, such an example here in the US how the central government is failing people. And we know with Katrina and Harvey and so on, how many people died because the government, uh, you know, until they decided who to send and what measures to do, uh, they were flying over uh, New Orleans and seeing how people are dying and drowning and doing nothing just from above watching. So, um, for example, in uh, in Houston, during Harvey, a social innovator named John Cole created a um, platform called Social SOS Shell dot network. You can go and see it, in which he enabled just exactly like this decentralization, so people can uh, borrow, uh, let's say, boats or could go to someone who was on a roof and bring water and, and so on and so forth at the local level to rescue people, not to wait for the FEMA to, until they come and, and, uh, and rescue them. In the UK, another social innovator right now during the COVID-19, he has created uh, a homeless charity on blockchain, uh, Freedom X it's called, in which he uh, gives people shelter. So he, of course, gets money from uh, the rich people to his charity, but on blockchain. So people can see or even decide how the money is spent for yeah. the homeless, uh, uh, you know, maybe. They, uh, someone gave a home to a pregnant uh, teenager who really was in the streets. So it depends, you can, you can choose how you, uh, and who you help on blockchain. So blockchain helps in that regard. Social innovation is critical, as I was mentioning with entrepreneurs. Other ways which are, you know, maybe, I mean, equally revolutionary in one way, uh, but like, for example, in the fight against uh, pollution and, and the fight for climate. In Ithaca, Ithaca in New York, actually they had uh, also in the, uh, early 19th, they had the Itaka hour because there was like a, an economic situation there and they created their own virtual, uh, their own uh, currency, like local community currency. But these days with blockchain, a social entrepreneur named Scott Morris, he created the so-called Coin Foundation, Q-U-O-I-N Foundation, mm -hmm. which is um, giving people incentives and again with credits and so on and so forth, is giving people points for, let's say, taking their bike to work instead of taking the car to work. And then with those points, they can buy uh, food from cer uh, certain, let's say, health stores, better food. They can uh, they can get um, uh, vitamins and so on. So he's creating a healthy living in that part of the world, a, co a community which is driven by that and the movement at the same time. So uh, this kind of movement also can be spearheaded, of course, by uh, by local governments. And I want just to give you one more example here. In the state of New York, and this is kind of, you know, very, very crucial now with COVID-19, many people, of course, they lost their jobs and uh, there are also stay-at-home moms and grandmothers who are cooking and they usually had to go and uh, earn their money in restaurants. Now the restaurants are closed. So, uh, an assemblyman from the New York State, he created the so-called inclusive value ledger. This inclusive value ledger is a, a, has a sort of currency, local currency, which is rewarding people and caregivers uh, with, uh, with credits and with money which they can exchange in the US dollar and then buy. Uh, so it's creating a, a value where there is value but unrewarded so it's called inclusive value ledger for the home work which is done at home and so on and in this way wow. helping people who lost their jobs so if i cook for my grandchildren uh, i cannot cook in the restaurant but i can now be paid to cook here at home and and maybe i can get more children in my home and, and distribute food to their uh, to my neighbors and so on because i'm a cook but i lost my job and also, like, there is a very famous chef here, Chef Andre, I do not know from, uh, uh, anyway, see, in other hurricanes, he also emerged. So he created uh, his um, uh, Kitchen Central, which is a movement uh, in which he actually created uh, his own network of uh, restaurant, um, uh, let's say, cooks who lost their jobs because the restaurants are closed, but he employed them to create uh, meals and to, to do meals for the emergency responders, for the nurses in hospitals and for the homeless. 
So he created this movement again. And of course, blockchain could help. He's not using blockchain. He is using his own network. But uh, but just example, there are so many examples of this, uh, yeah. of how people can, can actually self-organize. So. But when I was uh, searching online about decentralized communities and uh, uh, totalitarian uh, dictatorship, stuff like that, I found an interesting quote uh, from... Uh, Michael Polanyi's uh, book, yes. The Logic of Liberty, which is really interesting. I will read it to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm a great fan of his work. A man alone in the wilderness is vulnerable to threats. When he enters into society, however, he combines with others who, with common interests, serve and protect each other from outside threats. Uh, if society grows large, materializing as vast states or governments, the people therein lose their sense of common purpose, their desire to unify for mutual benefit and protection. Uh, fractions and classes arise, each contending for power. Uh, the people in whom the sovereignty of the central power supposedly resides may become disempowered and marginalized as the network of bureaucratic uh, functionaries proliferates. Uh, the people are displaced by arms and agencies of the central power. Although progress cannot be achieved without constructive competition among between the rival groups, societies cannot flourish when the inhabitants do not share a fundamental sense of common purpose and identity. So basically what is going on in the world right now and what with what you open this talk about how communities were uh, decentralized communities existed in the past so ever since blockchain appeared it somehow challenged this status quo uh, in your opinion how are governments holding back the achievement of decentralized communities because somehow they are doing it yes but i have to also make a few comments here to to your quote um so I don't know if you are aware of the work by Michael Albert. Michael Albert wrote a book called uh, Power to the Edge. And he wrote that book, and, and I met him because I was working with this FEMA incident command system with emergency responders to make them more responsive, more flexible, less top down. Again, give more power to the people at the fringes to, to take action. So he wrote this power to the edge, but afterwards, like about five years after that book, he wrote another book, which is called Partici Parecon, Participatory Economics. And it's exactly along the lines of your quote. So to enable everyone to participate, uh, you know, so to, to organize society in a participatory manner, much more involved. He called them balanced job complexes. And if you read the book, you will find a lot of uh, principles there, which are aligned and very well summed up in your quote. Then there's um, another book, which I uh, remind you reminded me with the quote, which is by Robin Chase, who is the co-founder or actually the founder of Zipcar. And she is also passionate about sharing economy and so on and so forth. So we met because, uh, you know, and just incidentally, my former master's student was the co-founder of Uber. So, you know, we were kind of in the same sharing economy mindset. And she wrote a book called Peers Incorporated, in which, you know, she was uh, talking about that equality, which we are talking about. So to create a society where everybody is a peer versus, you know, top down, I make decisions and you have to listen and, and to do what I say to you, or otherwise <laughs> you're going to be kidnapped. <laughs> I like to say what is happening here. So, so totally, totally agreed. And there's uh, you can go deeper into these books and see, and of course, into Polanyi's work. But what I want to do is also to <clears throat> to quote from one of my works, which is called um, "Organic Governance." And this, um, uh, this my my work on organic governance, and you can find it by googling my name and organic governance. Uh, it st starts like that. The biggest challenge mankind faces today is not the development of more breakthrough technology, because our topic is here, blockchain, and it seems to me that you think that blockchain is going to be the foundation. <laughs> but blockchain is a technology which enables. That's why I started with, you know, before blockchain, what was happening and what blockchain enables. So the biggest challenge mankind faces today is not the development of more breakthrough technology. It is to create a society whose institutions integrate the knowledge that must precede 
any such technology, including knowledge about these institutions themselves. The inherent problem stems from our limited capacity to comprehend the interplay of large crowds of people and to transcend our own individual psychology rooted in interactions with groups of tens, not billions. And that is, again, coming back to the need for decentralized communities, because that's where you can actually track those exchanges. But what blockchain enables is to enlarge those groups because you can now track and you have this ledger in which you can track the exchanges. And so that mechanism that can really uh, deploy uh, much better uh, things. So I think that answers somehow your question if blockchain can, uh, can yeah. be of any help. But government still, I just wanted to answer this one, if government is opposed. Of course, it is opposed in many ways. And when I say, of course, because yeah. governments do not want to give up and the behemoth, the corporations, they do not want to give their power up so easily. Why would they? So, you know, in, in, in Austria, in the city of Vorgel, I don't know if you know about those, but government intervened in the 30s to, to stop that movement. <laughs> so oh, the vouchers okay. were cancelled. So from there, so historically uh, speaking, as well as, you know, in Kenya, I was mentioning the Ecopesa, which this uh, luminary social innovator has created. Well, he ended up in jail. He ended up uh, as uh, being accused by the Kenyan government that he wants, uh, he, he is organizing a terrorist plot to undermine the Kenyan ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and then with uh, intervention from the Hague, from the tribunal, from, from the liberty movement and so on, he got out of jail. And then now he's working and, you know, in May he, he was thrown in jail. In November he got out of jail and was starting to work with the Kenyan government on these decentralized communities. But just so you know, the knee-jerk reaction of government is to stop, uh, uh, to stop that. And, um, and there are many more examples. For example, you know, now uh, with blockchain, yes, we, we know that here in the U.S. we cannot actually use cryptocurrencies because we have uh, the, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission against us and at our throats and so on and so forth. But you can see that governments are trying to use and are starting to use the technology like the digital dollar. Now yeah. they're talking digital euro. Yeah. As well as corporations, Facebook with the Libra and so on, they like it but they want to keep the power and to oil their own wheels with the blockchain technology. And that's why decentralized communities will have to really, really go against uh, the powers in this way as well. So yeah. it's, um, it's not a bed of roses, not an easy road. That's why I say decentralization warriors. <laughs> oh, okay. Somehow we are at war with the corporations, but um, I am, optimistic you know i'm 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 positive that way yeah i i mentioned this because blockchain was the the biggest disruptive that was promised to mankind in the past few years because ever since blockchain appeared everybody had visions about it and uh, i think it's going to take about 15 to 20 years to unfold so coming back to current times <laughs> talking about totalitarian <laughs> governments and everything uh if anyone from the viewers would like to have some questions, just type it in the chat box and uh, I will address it to uh, Dr. M. <laughs> and uh, with your permission, uh, I would like to connect now with uh, Pompilio Diplan, uh, who is on the line with us, uh, who is among the main organizers of the protests in Bucharest in Romania, what I was talking about with you last week. Yes. Uh, which were going on in the past 14 days almost about the mm -hmm. law which is giving unlimited powers for the authorities to force any person with any type of pathogen even if they are not showing symptoms to be hospitalized for 48 hours which is really crazy it is and it also i mean it's a risk to their own health as a, okay as so saying. pompilio can you hear us yes okay hi hello hello, hello. <laughs> Okay, so what's so, uh, what's going on over there? Well, it's it's been some rough weeks. Uh, we had some demonstrations on the fifteenth of May. Uh, it was an, a three-day interval between 
the alert state and the emergency state. There is stare de alerta and stare de urgenza in Romanian. And um, we took advantage of that uh, uh, no man's land, no man's delay, so to speak. And we protested then. And then we intensified our protests with this new, new law. It came out as Law 433 in 2020, which is a law of, we call it the um, sanitary arrest law. Uh, huh. It has a more complicated and bureaucratic name. But it is a terrible law that really tramples on our constitutional rights and freedoms. It's a disaster. As I was saying in, in, in our demonstrations, it's, uh, we, are, we are watching in slow motion the assassination of a country, the assassination of our rights, the assassination of our freedoms, the assassination of our economy. Um, the funny thing is that Romania is only a frontliner in this uh, ter terrific movie, but this, the same thing happens in other countries with the, the, the fear of the second wave, with the sanitary bureaucracy, with the installation of sanitary rules which are trampling the freedom of people's freedom, basically. And, uh, well, the whole Europe is going to wear masks eventually, which is uh, pretty absurd for, a, for, for an illness which, is, uh, which has not done more fatalities than, than an ordinary flu. So uh, basically now everybody is lining up and queuing at the Avocatul Poporului, uh, the sort of ombudsman, the, the defender of the rights of people. It has a pompous name, but basically that's what it is. Uh, it's a role played by an ex-Soros uh, leader called Renate Weber. Uh, and everybody's putting their hopes into this lady. And um, as far as I know, there has been some few days since the law has been uh, proclaimed by the president. And nevertheless, we didn't get a, uh, a uh, uh, rebuttal, a sort of... Uh, any sort of criticism and any sort of um, uh, reclaiming this law as an unconstitutional law by the lawyer of the people called Renate Beva. So the, the situation right now is a little bit worrisome. We are in, in boiling waters and um, I'm not exactly sure how this relates to your subject, but... Um, uh, the community that uh, Mrs. Uliero is talking about, uh, in this case, appears to be the whole Romanian people at odds and uh, in a sort of fight with the uh, bureaucracy of the government and uh, the parliament and so on. The parliament was a total disappointment. They voted like they were on uh, uh, autopilot mode. They, mm -hmm. There were only... Uh, 11 abstainments and vetoes, eight vetoes and three abstainments, and the whole rest of 126 senators were voting for this uh, terrible law. A law which allows uh, me to be separated from my children, not based on these crappy PCR tests. Let's say, if, if it was based on tests, you could blame it on their lack of knowledge of scientific uh, foundation about the, the PCR tests, the reverse transaminase PCR test, but, but on suspicion of being uh, infected, right? So if, yeah. I have a, if I have a neighbor who has a chip on his shoulder and uh, he wants some sort of revenge, maybe because I was knocking too loud on his or her wall, uh, I may be get I may I may get I may be arrested uh, based on um, uh, delatione on um, on, yeah, on if you being... are coughing, let's say yeah he heard you coughing and he says he can tell someone oh my neighbor is coughing please arrest him <laughs> sanitary correct. arrest correct my this goodness. is this is some sort of uh, digital Stalinism so we are yes. back in China from that from that point of view. And that's why it happens that I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, yeah. this new 
a new new system of uh, cryptocurrencies because uh, well it leads uh, and social points like the social network that you were mentioning and so on it leads to some sort of digital leninism that we saw in china we don't like uh, this this new world we rather we are rather inclined into uh, into em em uh, empathizing with uh, principles of uh, british conservatism which are saying what is not necessary to be changed it's necessary to not be changed so we, we basically we sort of like our our old world we sort of we can't say it was perfect before 15th of march but uh, we definitely regret it so that's that's how things are are happening okay. right now we're calling them ass- assassins economic assassins freedom assassins and uh, sanitary assassins so uh, it, it's happening right now it's like a Czechoslovakian uh, spring in 68 it's just that romania is an exaggerated experiment but we're seeing it in various european countries that's my point okay yes michaela yes. would you like maybe to ask pompidou something about yes, this yes. so i have a suggestion you know we have here in the us we have a um, a tv show called democracy now and i think uh, you zoltan should get in touch with them and i will connect you so to bring this to their attention and they will expose what's going on and they are widely viewed that's one number one because i find it really my i like feel like fainting when i hear this it's so close to uh what was happening as he said stalinist and and i can call it chauvinism as well so so in in the in the times of the communism uh, it was like the same this uh, conspiracies and uh, and fake uh, uh n- news about uh, my neighbor now okay he coughed uh, he should be put in in hospital at once the, the we funny cannot thing. breathe we cannot sneeze we cannot you know yes uh, uh, totally i could not agree more one thing i wanted to mention because you know um uh, blockchain is not the same as facebook so there is a big difference here and i agree that the centralized platform facebook or which i call fake book <laughs> uh, or you know uh, all these other centralized platforms they are um, getting in there as you know the google as a political force and and facebook as a political force and they are the new stalins and the new the new uh, dangers for society but blockchain is enabling decentralized and also is a trustless uh, trustless platforms and i would recommend sapien.network is a the facebook on blockchain which i am creating creating together with a former students from berkeley where i'm also teaching with the entrepreneurship uh, uh, class so there are ways to implement social networks that preserve the truth and and they are democratic and uh, uh, so so not uh, is this is not about blockchain it is about social networks misused and how they actually grew into the behemoth and centralized platforms which are nothing different they are just competing so the digital dollar and libra they compete for power but they are both centralized and both uh, uh, imposing powers on us on the fringes and on our liberties and poised uh, to uh, to do that so we can um, use our entrepreneurial spirit to deploy platforms that can free us from them and can expose the truth just like zoltan is doing now with his uh, of course it's much more complex and you i mean you address so many issues here that cannot be solved in a second and also not with technology but with the people and their minds and from there to deploy the right technologies uh i will be yeah. thinking i have to think about this because i am honestly very revolted and shocked not only i was shocked with what is happening in the us but hearing what is happening there of course is uh, is uh, uh unbelievable especially that it triggers so many memories uh, from back when i was living in communism <laughs> and, uh, and now i'm like to see that this is happening is uh, really very disheartening and uh, yes i i will be in touch with you Zoltan, to put you in touch with this uh, yeah, we, we we can create a, a perfect freedom for everybody <laughs> 
uh, yeah, we, well, at least yes. And I, there are there are some uh, movements in this uh, regard, which I mentioned to you, Bancor, but also Cardano blockchain. If you will go and and look at Car what yeah. Cardano is doing, is uh, very similar to this, and they are very concerned about human liberties, about eradication of poverty, as well as uh, yeah, especially the human liberties. Uh, so, and this democracy now, uh, I'm going to introduce you to them. Pompiliu, one, one, one thing. I don't think that we will ever go back to the way things were because this will not happen unless it's really going to be a big fight and there will be bigger crowds to do it. But what is your opinion that what should the steps to be, should be taken to somehow make it better for, because you need help, definitely. And everybody with the process needs help. Well, I'm not sure exactly who will be able to help us in this new world. Uh, Cause uh, top down, the intention appears to be for in enforcing uh, some sort of stakeholder capitalism. Okay. Uh, the World yeah. Economic Forum that uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Olieru is working for is one of the actors in this domain. Uh, and that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that sort of worries me. Uh, like, if they, if they don't want to implement the old normality, if they really want to change things, well, what can we do? We're going to be subject to digitalization, the mandatory vaccines, and um, uh, sanitation dictatorship um, in in some sort of with a with a good PR uh, but um, as far as we are concerned we're gonna fight as with the old classical democratic uh, means that we have street means demonstrations protests electoral means and um, media means like movies and so on yeah uh, I'm not sure exactly how how Dr. O'Leary is feeling about the new normality? Is she positive about it or is she negative? Like mixed feelings? Um, I mean, what do you call the new, new normality? There are many things which I want to respond to you on and I completely agree with the World Economic Forum. I'm not making the rules and the policies. Uh, Klaus Schwab is the, the leader of the World Economic Forum and it is uh, uh, actually he has a team well, which is very close to him, but uh, of course he has also his own uh, ideas of how to run it and uh, and this multi-stakeholder capitalism. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the World Economic Forum from how he, it is, um, uh, how the power is distributed, the power of decision there, is, uh, it is uh, definitely not uh, aligned with uh, equality. I mean, it's those with deeper pockets who can pay more on the membership. They have a uh, a uh, bigger voice around the table and they can have more representation. So it is uh, it is uh, staking in a way. Yeah? So the more uh, more money you have, the more power you have uh, <laughs> on the decision making there or yeah. on, uh, on the ways. But once we know that, and, and that's why it, it was quite difficult for me to put blockchain on among the top uh, uh, technologies because uh, they so I mean they were very much opposed, but uh, I won the fight. That's why I call myself a warrior. And now we have a council, and we have the so-called presidio principles at the World Economic Forum, which are fighting for this equality, starting with our own data and of course our own freedoms. So there, there's a wide membership uh, to these presidio uh, principles, and we have a council on blockchain. Um, so I think I already stated how I feel. I just wonder if uh, there's anything which was not clear. Yeah, Pompidou, I saw that you would like to add something. Or... I just want to. I just want to apologize, but I have a meeting in five minutes. Okay. And I have to turn off my camera and leave the meeting. I apologize. No worries. It, it was nice it's to so have good you. to have you here. Uh, nice to touch you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so these are, are really, really mixed feelings around the world. And that's what makes it great, because we can share our opinions and, and, and agree or not agree on them. But that's what makes it so special. No, absolutely, absolutely. And um, 
uh, but of course, uh, it's not only there in Romania, but in many other parts. And the, the discussion now around the world is this totalitarian realism. Yeah. Uh, even in the, I mean, in the democratic parts of the world, at least how we know them as democratic, now it's kind of reversing. And uh, and as you say, both sides. Yes, I mean, I mean, both sides are blaming each other. Exactly. Uh, the, the right is sending uh, troops uh, in Portland. Portland is fighting <laughs> against, and maybe in some parts of of the city there are lootings and riots and exactly and, and, and discipline. So it's a sort of craze that is created now with this pandemic accelerating all the you know people's frustrations and. That's why, as I was saying at the individual level, we have to do some soul searching as well with ourselves and see who we are, because it is from who we actually are or what we want to become that we are acting in the world. And if we really uh, want to become those, um, uh, yes, freedom, yes, but also freedom in a community. So it is accountability, accountability for my actions. Yes, how far do I go with my protest? I mean, am I going to uh, break into someone's home and steal their food <laughs> from the fridge? Or where am I stopping and how yeah, exactly. am I Exactly, yeah, which has nothing to do with your... Um, it's the movement or movement. cause. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, saw, we were following the news about the protests in the US with these, yeah. uh, some houses were burned down and stuff like that, which had nothing to do actually with all the, the movements. Okay, so I have a question from the a question from the other one, which is really interesting. Do you think that there will be many more cryptocurrencies coming if there are more decentralized communities? The, uh, it is the, the 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 question is kind of giving the answer, you know. <laughs> so you can, and and there are there is another social innovator which I did not uh, mention. I did not have time to mention. And thank you for this question. So, the with cryptocurrencies, you can decentralize communities in several ways. For example, Acon. I don't know if you know the singer yeah, Acon. Uh, he is doing now the A coin in mm -hmm. Africa. He was given, because he is from Senegal, so he was given land to create uh, the Acon city in Senegal, which is a smart city that will use only his coin, a coin. Yeah, yeah. But he also has solar projects uh, and renewable energy projects across Africa. And um, so his ultimate goal is to use a coin, his own coin, throughout Africa to okay. empower the communities from mm -hmm. the slums in Africa. So just one coin. On the other side, we have the communities which are uh, pleading, no, I'm going to have my own cryptocurrency. I'm, de I'm deploying my own coin in my community. You know, so, so you can do it both ways. I think the more community you will have, they will have to decide what they want to use. And of course, there are incentives to use Acorn because he can support you also, let's say, with credits or with some non-profit and so on and so forth. Uh, but there are also other advantages of having your own and being totally independent and because that's the purpose of the decentralized communities. So so thank you for the question. The answer is both. <laughs> you, can okay. have, you can have less currencies, but still decentralized communities. And you can have many cryptocurrencies, but with a system like Bancor, that is what it enables. Algorithmically to exchange one cryptocurrency into an, another seamlessly. Like for example, if I'm in a tribe which is using, let's say, phishing-oriented uh, cryptocurrency, and I want to exchange with another community to get meat or for another to get technology, then when I pay with my currency through the bank or protocol, it converts directly into your currency, seamlessly. So you receive <laughs> your own money. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, yeah, the, the answer which, is both. <laughs> which is interesting because this was my next question in regards to how you can convert and connect these type of communities. But yes, that, that protocol has already, already exists. All right. Yeah. So... I think we said too many informations because there are not that many questions. So yeah. as a and final word, how would you like to close this uh, webinar? 
Uh, well, what I can say is that uh, I'm very happy, uh, first of all, to know that there are people like you who are promoting uh, uh, and fighting for freedom and, and for truth and, and uh, bringing to the fore uh, these crucial issues, crucial matters, yes, like the decentralized communities, what's going on in the world and, and uh, uh, the infringements to our freedoms, because that is in the first place, that is uh, the impetus for these decentralized communities, yes, to, to empower them. Empowerment of the fringe versus decentralized powers to, to decide for me and uh, put me in this sanitary jail and, and stuff like that. So, so I, I really commend you for that. I believe that uh, the world, you know, is now accelerating what is happening in the world, all the interconnected crises. So we cannot have a resilient world if we do not have decentralization. Decentralization. That's why starting with the incident command system, uh, which was too centralized and they could not respond in, in time. One important uh, message which I want to leave you with is that the more complexity we have to deal with in the world, the less the totalitarian structures are able to cope with that complexity and the more problems we will have. In order to cope with complexity, as uh, nature taught us, we have to work decentralized. If we look at the bees, for example, if they have too many in, that, uh, in their place, then uh, a bee queen emerges, they just Create, yes, the, from, from the eggs emerges and then it takes part of, uh, of them to another location in order to be able to cope with the complexity and to self organize. So, this is the only way for us forward in order to be happy and, and live a good life. But also, and as a last word, please also do some soul searching, look into yourself and see what you want to become because it's there where we will all end up as a community. Exactly, it's going yeah. to be reflected. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And because you you can you don't need to invent the technology because the technology is there. You can use it, use it. Just have the ideas that, that you would like. And to. how we use it is yeah. from who we are. Yes, that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You teach what you are, you do what you are. Yeah, exactly. Like we started these webinars for uh, technology talks, talks about fintech, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and we ended up speaking about communities because somehow everything connects. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Michaela, for uh, Thank you, joining us today. And uh, we will be back with our next webinars. Bye. Wonderful to be with you and to meet people like you. Bye-bye.